why you shouldn't do the Hintz exam in patients who don't have nystagmus, and why you shouldn't do the dix halpik test on patients with nystagmus. Hi, Peter Johns here. I'm an emergency physician with a keen interest in teaching how to evaluate vertigo. Whether to do the dix halpik test or the Hintz exam on a patient with vertigo often seems to confuse people, and it's a crucial point to understand. So here's the explanation for it. The dix halpik test and the Hintz exam are powerful bedside examination techniques, which when applied correctly can be used to definitively diagnose the most common peripheral cause of vertigo. That is, the dix halpik test rules in posterior canal, BPVV, and the Hintz exam rules in vestibular neuritis. And if you can do that, then you can basically rule out a dangerous cause of vertigo. But it's very important that you apply the right bedside test to the right patient population. And those populations are, Hintz exam should only be applied to patients with constant vertigo and spontaneous or gaze evoked nystagmus, and the dix halpike test to those patients with a minute or two of vertigo and don't have nystagmus. The most common mistake I see people make about this point is applying the wrong bedside test to the wrong patient population. So that's why I use the negative. That is, you shouldn't do the Hintz exam on a patient without nystagmus, and you shouldn't do a Dixall Pike test on a patient with nystagmus. I get asked about this quite a bit, and often from smart people who are very interested in learning about vertigo, but they can't find the reasoning for this statement easily. So right now, I'm going to give you the quick answer, and following that, a more detailed referenced answer. Why you shouldn't do the Hintz exam in patients who don't have nystagmus. Hints has not been adequately studied in patients with constant vertigo and no spontaneous or gaze evoked nystagmus, so it's not a reliable test in this patient population. And even worse, if you apply it to patients with transient vertigo, such as BPBV, you would see a normal head impulse test, and this would erroneously lead you to thinking that the patient had a central cause for their vertigo, because the head impulse test is in the Hintz exam to identify a vestibular nerve problem and thus diagnose vestibular neuritis. And BPBV patients don't have a vestibular nerve problem. They have an autoconia in their semicircular canal problem. In fact, if you applied the Hintz exam to normal people, that is those without vertigo or nystagmus, again, you would see a normal head impulse test, and if you weren't thinking straight, you might think this normal person without vertigo or nystagmus was having a cerebellar stroke. So you can only use the Hintz exam when the patient has ongoing constant vertigo and nystagmus. So why not do the dix halpike test on patients who have ongoing continuous vertigo and nystagmus? The dix halpike test is meant to diagnose posterior canal BPVV. Patients with posterior canal BPVV don't have ongoing continuous vertigo or spontaneous or gaze evoked nystagmus. So the diagnosis of posterior canal BPVV is already ruled out in patients with ongoing significant vertigo and nystagmus. And if you were to subject a patient with either vestibular neuritis or posterior circulation stroke to, Dix, to a dix halpike test, you might make the patient feel worse, and you might see an increase in their already present nystagmus, so that if you weren't thinking well, you might think that they had BPVV and try and cure them with an epi maneuver, which of course won't help in these conditions. And you wouldn't make the right diagnosis, which obviously could have dire consequences in the case of stroke. So that's the short answer. And if all that makes perfect sense to you, you can stop watching now. For those who would like a more detailed and referenced answer to these statements, here is the deeper dive. This is the original Hint study, published in 2009, the principal authors being Kata and David Newman Toker. The Hints exam, or Hints Plus exam, is a series of three bedside tests, or four in the case of the Hints Plus exam. Nystagmus, test of skew, head impulse test, and bedside test of hearing in the Hintz Plus exam. It's only meant to be applied to patients who have the acute vestibular syndrome, or AVS, where the basic differential diagnosis is, is this vestibular neuritis, which is more common, and has an abnormal head impulse test, or is this a, or is this a posterior circulation stroke, where the head impulse test is most often normal? I don't generally refer to the system of categorizing vertigo into different groups very much, as I find that unless you're a committed vertigo clinician, it's more likely to confuse you than to help you understand vertigo.
but you do need to understand the acute vestibular syndrome because acute vestibular syndrome is where posterior circulation strokes live and patients with vertigo who are having a stroke are the ones that justifiably scare us the most. We don't want to send somebody home with a diagnosis of vestibular neuritis when they're really having a stroke, now do we? So what is the acute vestibular syndrome? It's when the patient has many hours or days of ongoing continuous vertigo or dizziness, which gets worse with head movement, because all vertigo gets worse with head movement, nausea and or vomiting, difficulty walking, and nystagmus. Again, most of these patients will end up having vestibular neuritis, and they'll be confidently diagnosed with the HINTS exam by virtue of, of an abnormal head impulse test, and will be overall HINTS peripheral result. Patients who present in the first several days after the onset of vestibular neuritis have nystagmus. Then there'll be some patients who'll be having a posterior circulation stroke with other clinical features that would make you think right away that they're having a stroke, like new dysarthria or diplopia. Hints is less relevant in these patients as you're going to work them up a stroke no matter what their hints exam shows. And a smaller yet group will be having a stroke where it's very difficult to tell it's not just a case of vestibular neuritis. This is where a HINTS central result can be used to identify those subtle cerebellar strokes which look very much like vestibular neuritis. There are other conditions that might present with AVS as well, such as MS, but they're rare and, a, and not as time sensitive to diagnosis as a stroke is. HINTS is not meant to be applied to all patients who complain of dizziness or vertigo. That would lead to many false positive results. In other words, calling patients a stroke when they have another cause of vertigo that isn't a stroke. It should only be applied to patients with hours or days of constant vertigo and spontaneous or gaze-evoked nystagmus, which are the acute vestibular syndrome patients. Am I the only person who says this? Not at all. David Newman Toker, again one of the principal authors of the original Hintz paper, wrote this comment about another paper by Kerber, who's also a great researcher in vertigo. Hints should only be applied in acute vestibular syndrome patients with nystagmus. That seems pretty clear. And in a letter to a physiotherapy journal, David Newman Toker and a physiotherapist stated again, Hints is valid only in patients who have continuous vertigo or dizziness and spontaneous nystagmus. In this very nice paper by Edlow, a fellow emergency physician, and again, David Newman Toker, they state, case selection is critical, and it is generally unwise to rely on a normal head impulse test result if the patient has neither spontaneous or gaze-evoked nystagmus, because these are the key components of the acute vestibular syndrome presentation. And now, from both principal authors of the original HINTS study, David Newman Toker and Kata, Hints will work best in acute vestibular syndrome with spontaneous or gaze-evoked nystagmus. More recently, in 2018, Katag wrote this overview on the use of hints. He first gives the definition of acute vestibular syndrome as acute continuous vertigo associated with nausea, vomiting, and head movement intolerance, and references a paper by Hodson and Balo. Wait a minute, where's difficulty walking, and where's nystagmus? Just to show you how long I've been a vertigo nerd, I happen to have the original New England Journal of Medicine paper version, which was mailed to my house in 1998. And what did Hodson and Bailo say? Spontaneous nystagmus and postural instability. So this muddies the water slightly. Even stranger, if you look at the original hint study in the abstract, it states that the patients had nystagmus, but in the body of the paper, it says patients with acute vestibular syndrome with and without nystagmus. Yet in subsequent papers about HINTS, this one introduces the concept of the HINTS Plus, with David Newman Toker and Kata again, they had a, this paper had 190 patients versus 101 patients in the original study. And in both the abstract and the body of the paper, it states that the patients did have nystagmus. Getting back to the more recent overview by Kata, he does state that the HINTS triad is particularly helpful when evaluating patients with nystagmus and that there needs to be more investigation into the value of hints in patients without nystagmus. So I think we can see that the literature supports the idea that hints shouldn't be done on patients without nystagmus due to the fact that it just hasn't been studied. So what about doing hints on patients with likely BPVV, just to be sure? 
Again, some quotes from the previous papers I showed you, where David Newman Toker and Kata were both in agreement that you shouldn't do hints on patients with probable BPVV. And that letter in the Physiotherapy Journal outlines why. Because patients with BPVV have a normal head impulse test, which would make you think your patient with BPVV is having a stroke if you applied the hints exam to them. Now a reference for the second question, why you shouldn't do the Dix-Hulfpike test on a patient with nystagmus. Another paper with David Newman Toker as one of the authors published in the CMAJ in 2011. It basically states, in transient vertigo, then do the Dix-Hulfpike test. In acute vestibular syndrome, don't do it. Again, because you might fool yourself into thinking the patient has BPPV if the patient feels more dizzy and gets more nystagmus. And again, patients with posterior canal BPPV do not have spontaneous or gaze-evoked nystagmus. I hope this video cleared things up a bit for you. If you have any questions, just post them in the comments. I'm pretty good about answering them. As usual, if you want to learn more about vertigo, just look at my videos on BPPV, the HINTS exam, or the big three of vertigo. I'm sure most of you know how to find my other videos, but for those who don't look at YouTube much, first click on my name beside my picture, and then when you're on this page, you can click on the videos you can scroll down to see all my videos going back a decade or so. Thanks for watching.